Jessica Leahy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So you published a book called The Gift of Failure, How the Best Parents Learn to Let Go So Their Children Can Succeed. The backstory behind this book is interesting because you're a middle school teacher, God bless you, <laughs> and you're tasked with shepherding these kids into competent adulthood. Like they're that weird phase of life where they're not, like it's just weird. But you describe in the book, you discovered that you were failing at this job at home with your own kids. Tell us the backstory and that realization you had. Yeah, so full disclosure, I actually, I've taught for the past 20 years. I've taught every grade between 6 and 12. I actually, uh, currently, I teach kids who are in an inpatient drug and alcohol rehab setting. So I teach high school English and writing. I don't get to teach middle school kids that often anymore now that I'm on the road so much. But this this job of teaching the, the drug and alcohol rehab kids keeps me just continuously entertained. But yeah, that's exactly what happened is I was noticing that my students were not only less motivated to learn for the sake of learning, which is <clears throat> sort of a constant problem teachers are up against, but they were also less able to learn. And a lot of that seemed to be coming somewhere from this, like this more directive parenting style, this, or you can call it over parenting. You can call it helicopter parenting. In the research, they call it a directive parenting style. And I was pissed. I mean, I was, I was really, I mean, I, I admit this when I talk to parents, I was pissed off at my students' parents for really just derailing so many learning opportunities. And at that moment, when I was at sort of peak pissed off, <laughs> I realized that my own child, who was nine at the time, didn't know how to tie his own shoes. And I, I joke that, you know, when in cartoons, when the lightning bolt comes down and explodes or lights the main character on fire and they're, you know, reduced to an incinerated sort of pile of steaming ash. That's what I was because, you know, I, as pissed off as I wanted to be at the parents of my students, I had to admit that I was just like them. So, you know, the book really came out of this interest in helping my students learn better and be better learners, be more resilient. But it became pretty urgent when I realized that I was doing the exact same thing that those other parents were doing to their kids, to my own kids. And I had handicapped my own children, not just in terms of their resilience and their ability to just do stuff. But it turns out that the research is pretty clear that it, it undermines kids' ability to learn. So like the very things we're trying to do to make our kids succeed in school are actually undermining their ability to learn. All right. So let's talk about how we got here. Uh, so this, the guiding ethos <laughs> of parenting nowadays, is, yeah, he's directive parenting, over-parenting, right. helicopter parenting, whatever you want to call it. Right. What was it like in the past and how did we get to this point? You know, what were the cultural shifts that occurred? Because you kind of give this history of parenting in your book, which is really mm -hmm. interesting. That was really fun to to write also because, you know, those history, sort of how we got here chapters tend to be on the boring side. And so I was on like this mission to make the history chapter as entertaining as possible. And it was really fun. I, you know, it really is multifactorial. So we have kids later in a, our age, you know, when we're older, we have kids after we've been out on the workforce for, for a while, we have fewer kids. The state, the media has us believing that, you know, things are terribly dire, that our children are never going to get into college. They're certainly not going to do better than we did economically. So, you know, everything is just really dire. Everything's an emergency. Everything has to be perfect, like in this moment. And, and it's not really our fault in the sense that, you know, uh, the media, like I said, has told us that, you know, our children are being enticed online every single day. There's someone waiting on every street corner to abduct our children and sexually abuse them. And, you know, they're never getting into college anyway. But at the same time, you know, we're using a lot of the tools that we used out in the workforce to sort of manage our parenting. Like, I cannot tell you how many parents I've spoken to that have spreadsheets where either, you know, when the kids are really little, it's, you know, in what goes in and what comes out, like they're recording their poo and their pee and how much they eat and all that kind of stuff. Or, and now, parents can log on anytime they want to these grading portals that schools have opened up for parents' use. And they're logging on many, many, many times a day. I talk to parents who actually keep the portal open and just kind of hit refresh all day long. So we're using all these tools like databases and, and spreadsheets to track our kids' progress. And 
all of that is because we just want to know if we're doing okay. Because, you know, we don't get, we're used to performance reviews, but we just got to go with what we got, which is looking at our kids and seeing if our kids can give us the feedback on how we're doing as parents. And that's completely unfair to them, putting a lot of stress and anxiety on our kids. I'm hearing from kids all the time, you know, I don't understand why my parents expect me to be perfect because I can't be perfect. I'm trying as hard as I can and I can't. So, you know, we're judging our own parenting based on our kids and that's just completely unfair. Right. I mean, I, I think I think you mentioned this in the book, like in the past, like parents thought their job was like, keep your kids safe. Your job wasn't mm-hmm. going to make them happy. But right. now it's like, okay, we're keeping them safe and you got to make them happy. Well, and I'm certainly not the first one to point this out, but, you know, it used to be called child rearing. So it was very child centered. And now it's called parenting. It's very parent centered. And we freak each other out. You know, we go to all these soccer games and we sit in the waiting room outside, you know, while the kids are having their music lesson. And we talk about like the traveling soccer leagues and how many awards our kids are getting. And we, we sort of freak each other out and, and we're doing it to each other. Um, and that's, you know, that's something that we need each other to get out of too. You know, a lot of parents are like, you know, how do I, I don't want to be the first one to step back because then everyone's going to assume that I'm not doing my job. And, you know, I think we got to start undoing what we've been doing to each other. We're each other's own best supports as well. Right. And I'm sure the internet and social media is like just exacerbated the problem because. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, the Instagramming, you know, the dirty laundry is off on the outside of the picture so no one can see it. And, you know, we're making our lives look fairly curated and we're making our kids look really curated too. And that's teaching them to, you know, there's all sorts of stuff that's happening to them in terms of their social media use that we're just feeding into because as the more we curate our own lives and curate their existence on social media, the more they're going to do the same. Okay, so let's talk about the downsides of sure. this sort of directive parenting. I mean, what does yeah. the research say? What's happening to kids because of this over direct, over over parenting? Well, there's a couple of things we need to talk about, I suppose. The first one is, you know, anyone who's familiar with Dan Pink and the work that Drive was based on, Edward DC's work, how, Why We Do What We Do, The Science of Self-Motivation, knows that, you know, we have 40 years of really good research that shows that extrinsic motivators don't work if you want to get your kid to do something, if you want to get anyone to do something. So really, if you want kids to do something that requires long-term focus. And if you want kids to do things that require creativity, then giving them something like, you know, paying them for their grades, giving them a car if they stay on the honor roll, surveillance, you know, going on the portal, knowing where your kids are all the time because you're tracking them on their phone. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do any of these things. I'm just pointing out these are extrinsic motivators and they undermine motivation. So in other words, you know, if you don't If you want your kid to not want to learn math, pay them for their math grades. It's really quite clear. The research is really, really clear. And we know the research is solid because we have studies of the studies. We have metadata. Uh, So that's one side of it. What we want is intrinsic motivation, which requires us to give our kids more autonomy, which is kind of like independence, give them more control over the details of their lives, help them feel competent which is not the same thing as confident and be really connected to our kids. And the problem is, is that underparenting undermines a couple of these things. Number one, it it undermines your connection with your kid because I don't know how you feel at the end of the day after nagging your kid to do your, their homework about a hundred times, but I feel terrible and it's not good for our relationships, but also Kids who are more directed by their parents, kids who are told, you know, do this first, then do this. No, 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 do it this way, not that way. No, 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 the dishes don't go in the dishwasher that way, they go this way. No, 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 don't use a hammer that way, use it this way. Kids who are told how to do things step by step are less able to be frustrated. They don't like develop the emotional wherewithal to know how to be frustrated. So when you put those kids in a room by themselves to do something without, you know, a person there to direct them, you know, when we give kids directions and we we make their lives very step by step, they don't develop the emotional wherewithal they need in order to be frustrated. And two of the most important teaching tools I have as a teacher require kids to be able to be frustrated. These things called desirable difficulties, giving kids work that's a little bit above their ability level and then letting them figure things out for themselves. And, 
giving kids constructive feedback on sort of a daily basis so they can see where they are with their, with their learning. Those things don't work with kids who can't hear negative feedback and who can't get frustrated. And those kids are harder to teach. You know, I, I can tell when a kid is being overparented from pretty much the first day of class because I, uh, you know, they're the kids who are constantly raising their hands and saying, what do I do next? What do I do next? And, you know, that I'd rather have kids of average intelligence who can be frustrated than super genius kids who don't know how to be frustrated. They're just, you know, kids who can persist, kids who are a little more resilient, kids who can, you know, take a breath and say, oh, no, wait a second. I think I can figure this out. Those kids learn better learn better than their peers who can't be frustrated anyway. And you also highlight, and I've been seeing more research about this too, is that this sort of rising generation of kids, like they're more anxious yeah, and they have a lot of anxiety problems and depression issues. And it might stem from the overparent because they're always told what to do. They don't know how to deal with uncertainty. You know, there's, it's that, yes. But, you know, a lot of it, I think actually also has to do with the fact that we expect kids, like I said, I, I hear this all the time. We expect kids to be perfect. We expect them to be good athletes and good musicians and great in school and never get anything below an A. And that's, you know, that's part of the pressure, but the rest of it, the thing that I think is actually really hurting them is that we expect them to do that effortlessly, to never break a sweat, to never make it look like they have to work too hard because, uh, and I have to, you know, shout out to Carol Dweck and her work in the, in the book mindset, you know, these kids tend, tend to believe that um, because we tell them they're smart all the time and we tell them how accomplished they are all the time, that the minute they look like they're having to put out an effort, we're not going to believe them about that them anymore. If they look like they have to work hard, then, you know, maybe they're not just naturally smart. Maybe they're just, you know, faking it. So uh, it's this weird catch 22. You know, I need kids to raise their hands and admit when they don't know something. I need kids to take challenge problems so that they can, you know, embrace these desirable difficulties. And yet kids who believe that if they show any weakness, then they're less than perfect and they're not as smart as we think they are, are less likely to raise their hands and ask for help and less likely to admit they don't know something and less likely to take challenge problems. So the very things that, you know, telling kids constantly how smart they are, how talented they are, how genius they are, undermines a kid's ability or the likelihood that a kid will push themselves to move outside their comfort zone. Because when I ask kids about this, they always, they're, <laughs> they're so cute. They're always really clear. They're like, well, of course we're not going to take the challenge problems because we don't want to get anything wrong. Cause then you're going to know we're not as smart as you think we are. And of course we're not going to raise our hand in class because then you'll know that we're not as smart as, and our peers will know and our parents will know. So keep the challenge problems away. Don't ask us any questions. Don't ask us to admit when we don't know something and we'll just pretend that we know everything and hopefully uh, learn something along the way. And that's just, that's not where good learning happens. Right. And you highlight this in the book too, not only that expectation of perfection and effortless perfection, prevents students from taking on challenges, but it also it, it sort of acts as a, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, a source of cheating. Like it makes people want to cheat, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. they got to be perfect. Yeah. Carol, Carol Dweck showed that pretty clearly in one of her experiments that I just love that when you ask kids to report, self-report their grades, kids who have been sort of set up to have a fixed mindset about intelligence, that it's this thing that you either have or don't have, they're more likely to lie about their scores because, well, of course course, because they want you to think that they're smart and they'll defend that at, at any turn. And there's a book I love called Cheating Lessons by James M. Lang. And in his book, he makes it really clear. He says, look, if you want to create a classroom full of cheaters, just keep telling him how smart, telling them how smart they are and foster this fixed mindset. What we should be doing actually is foster is making sure kids understand that intelligence is malleable, that the more you push yourself out of your comfort zone, the more you'll learn, the more you can learn things that are different and new and the more connections you'll make in your brain. And yes, telling them that is great and teaching them about that about it, about that is great. But where we really seem to be falling down on the job is by modeling that. And so I'm a big fan of, you know, talking to our kids when we screw up and showing them that we're willing to try things that are scary for us because, you know, we can blah, blah, blah as much as we want, but they stop listening after a while. Uh, what they really believe is what they see. And if we're 
modeling that sort of approach, that fearless approach to things that are a little bit scary, then, you know, I think they're a lot more likely to take our word for it. Okay. So controlling parenting, directed parenting is like something we don't want to do. What sort of parenting should we take? What does the research say that sort of the style the ethos is the most conducive to producing, you know, well-adjusted, competent kids? I, I actually refer to the research of this woman named Wendy Grolnick. And in one experiment, she had parents come in and, and she gave the kids a task to do. And she watched the parents to see how the parents dealt with really general instructions, which was be there with while your child completes this task. And the parents who were really, really directive about with their kids where they, you know, told the kids how to do the task and gave them step-by-step instructions. When the parents were removed from the situation and the kids had to try a task on their own, the kids were a lot less likely to be able to finish it on their own. By contrast, the parents who sort of were just there and supportive while the kids did the task the way they wanted to do the task. And if the kids got frustrated, which by the way, the task they were given was a little frustrating on purpose. The parents that sort of helped the kid refocus, maybe repeated the instructions, but didn't give the answers. Those parents were termed autonomy supportive parents. And that is just what it sounds like. It supports the kid's autonomy to do something the way they want to do it and to make the mistakes and to figure out what part of the mistake not to bring forward with them and to know how to do it differently the next time. That autonomy supportive parents parenting style doesn't mean that we, you know, abandon our kids and say, Hey, here's, you know, replace this carburetor. Good luck. Here's a YouTube video. Um, you know, there are parents that are nearby and, and present, but not right on top of the kids, not reteaching algebra one when the kid doesn't understand, you know, one tiny homework problem. These are parents that say, you know, why don't you think about it a different way? Or I noticed that you, did this differently four problems ago. Why do you think you did it differently four problems ago? And now you're having problems here with this math problem. Autonomy supportive parenting is, is pretty magic stuff because the more you let your kids have autonomy, the more competent they're going to feel. And the more competent they feel, the more they feel like they can attack things and can handle things that are beyond their ability level. So it's this wonderful self, self perpetuating cycle. And the other cool thing, uh, I get a lot of letters from parents who have gone ahead and, you know, backed off a little and let the kid, you know, start loading the dishwasher or putting dishes away or whatever the thing is, the thing that the parent thought the kid could never handle on their own. And I, you know, they always say, you know, yes, yes, my kid is m- much more competent now and that's fantastic. And they're much more autonomous now and that's fantastic. But what's really magical are the letters that explain that once their kid had more autonomy and became more competent, that their relationship with their kid improved. And I hear that over and over and over. And it's certainly been true in my own family. The more we're spending time talking about things that really matter to the kid, as opposed to, you know, have you finished that math homework yet? Ah, you did this wrong. Ah, do it differently. That's that's the great stuff right there. Like the idea that we can improve our relationships with our kids if we actually leave them alone more and give them, you know, just less guidance as to how to get things done perfectly. I, I, that's that's pretty important to me to make sure that parents understand that this is about our relationships with our kids too, not just about raising competent adults. But the thing, it sounds great, but it's also really hard to do, <laughs> right? Because like yeah. you, you see your kid, yeah. I've, I've had this experience, you watch your kid doing something yeah. and they're doing it completely wrong, right? And so it's oh, like it's something, that should have, something that should have just taken a minute yeah. ends up taking 10 minutes. You're just like, all right, just you're so tempted. And I've done it before. Sometimes yeah. like, I just take it and let me do it. Yeah. So how do you resist that urge to step in and just be like, this is going to be a lot easier if I just do it? Well, I can tell you right now, it's going to be a lot harder for parents who are obsess- obsessive compulsive. And I can tell you right now, I like the dishwasher you know, loaded in a certain way. I like East, West, not North, South, you know, that kind of thing. And I I like things the way I like them. And that was really hard to get over. I think the easiest way to start thinking differently about it is to start thinking long-term. Our kids' growth and development, our kids' learning, our kids becoming more competent, it doesn't happen in these like in moment to moment. It happens long-term. So if you can start thinking, okay, I got to think, where do I want my kid to be in six months or a year? Do I want my kid to get the dishwasher loaded perfectly right this very second? Or in six months, would I like to know that my kid will do this on their own without me reminding them? Do I need 
this math homework to be perfect for the teacher. And by the way, stop doing your kid's homework because homework is information for the teacher. Like when I see homework that clearly parents have meddled in, I get a good sense of what the parents know, but it doesn't give me great information about what the kid is learning. So do I want this homework to be perfect or you know, in six months, do I want my kid to really understand this concept and to be responsible for doing their homework completely, getting it in their backpack, making sure they get it out of their backpack, getting it in their teacher's hands. When we deliver items that have been forgotten at home, you know, it makes us feel great. It makes us feel like we're, you know, really, we got our kids back and we're really doing this parenting thing. And by the way, that teacher saw me deliver that homework. So now they know I'm really on the job. But I would much rather have a kid that, you know, down the road will remember to take the homework themselves and allow them to suffer the consequences in the short term so that in the long run, I have a kid who's much more competent. And that's, you know, just thinking long term is the first step. And the second step is to start thinking more about process over product. Stop being so obsessed with the perfect homework assignment and the A and the perfect score and start thinking more about whether or not your kid's learning something in the moment that you choose to step in. Uh, it's, it's really hard. It's hard to hold your tongue and it's hard to keep from just doing it for them because you can do it better. You can do it faster. You can do it right. But every time we step in and do something for our kids, because we feel like we can do it better, they don't appreciate that as, oh, great. I don't have to do that. They hear, my parents don't think I'm competent enough to do that myself. And we're actually undermining their competence and their confidence every time we step in and take over for them. So long-term over short-term, process over product. Those are my two big hints. Perfect. So what I love about the rest of the book, so you kind of lay out this overarching philosophy, but then you get into specific areas where parents can help their children experience failure in a safe environment where the, like, the stakes are completely low that will hopefully build that resilience and competency they want. So the first part you talk about is household duties is probably the what parents can do right away. Yeah. So, so again, like I said, th- th- it's hard to do because you could probably do this stuff <laughs> A lot faster and a you know a lot yeah. better than and your... they're going to drop stuff and they're going to break stuff right. and you know food is going to get hardened on the plate. But the cool thing about you know household duties is you know like you said the stakes are so low and you know I call them household duties actually for a reason. You know I used to call them chores, but frankly, do you want to do something? thing called a chore. I mean, that sounds like kind of a bummer to me. And, and their house, I call them household duties because they're part of what we do to support each other as a family. I love, love, love Ron Lieber's book, The Opposite of Spoiled, which is about kids and money. And it's he's really clear. He's the Your Money columnist at the New York Times. We don't pay kids to do household duties because Kids are supposed to do household duties because that's part of being a part of the family, not because you're getting paid for it. Money uh, and allowance is about budgeting and learning about money. So, you know, household duties sort of conveys this, you know, if you're not going to do it, who is going to do it? And it's going to have to be someone else in the family. And that's going to be, you know, why, why does that person have to do it and not you? So getting that through from a really young age helps kids understand that they have responsibilities in the family. And the coolest part about that is there's a bunch of studies that show that when kids have a hand in helping the family on a day-to-day basis, even if it's just little stuff like putting dishes away, that they're more resilient emotionally, that they're less likely to be emotionally harmed when big stuff goes down, like a divorce or a death or, you know, really big stuff, stressful stuff. They're a lot less likely to be harmed by that if they feel like they're participating in keeping the family going. And they're proud of themselves. And they're the number of pictures I get via email and and, uh, my website and stuff of kids doing stuff parents didn't expect that they were going to be able to do just it, it blows my mind it's it's so cool and the look on the kids faces like check me out look at what i'm doing it's just amazing to me i, I you know they're amazing pictures and i'm just so it, it's amazing it's a, such a great day for me when i get one of those emails because because it's like yeah there's another kid who feels like they're competent and whose parent understands that the more they help their field feel, their kid feel competent the more ki- competent their kid will become um it's it's cool stuff so how young should kids get started with household duties 
as young as they're able to pick up a toy and put it back in the box they got it out of. I mean, the nice thing is I'm talking like language from really early on is that, you know, we take care of each other and we take care of our things. And that starts from toddlerhood on. And I'm not talking about, you know, before a toddler goes to bed, they have to have their entire room clean. In fact, I, I, my, one of our positions, my positions is that in our house, kids get so little autonomy over their lives and their stuff that kids rooms are their own domain. I don't, I don't expect my kids to keep the room clean because it's just not, that's not my business. It's not my stuff. But kids, little toddlers can, you know, put a sippy cup in the bottom shelf of the dishwasher, you know, have a place down low where kids can get their own cup out, have a stool, have snacks for, you know, pre-prepare things for kids' lunches, like uh, carrots and, you know, some pre-sliced things and put them down low in the refrigerator where kids can reach them themselves and put their own lunches together. There's a a little bit of anecdotal evidence. There's never, I haven't seen a big study on this, but there's anecdotal evidence to show that when kids prepare their own lunches, there's less food waste. They throw less of their lunch away and they eat more of their own creation. And if you help guide their tastes and you help guide their ingredients, that food will be healthier. So, you know, I, I, I don't make your kids lunches like from little, little kids, like from kindergarten on help guide them, make their lunches, but don't just make their lunches and stick their lunch in the bag and, and, you know, have them have no hand in that. It's, it's really important to help kids feel competent from a really young age, like pre-K. And I imagine, you know, as they get older, increase the level of responsibility. And I, I, I yeah. think with the guiding ethos be like, have them do more than you think they'd be able to do. <laughs> I always say, I mean, for all parents, even parents with special needs kids, I say, look, pretend like there's a line, you know, it, we all have this sort of line of, of, of competence for our kids, what we think our kids can do and what we think our kids can't do. And then let's just stick our toe just beyond that line. When I was doing research on, um, you know, I made all these, there are all these lists in the books uh, of in the gift of failure of what kids should be able to do at certain ages. And what's really mind blowing is if you look back at lists from, ex- for example, Maria Montessori's lists of, of chores kids could do at certain ages, there are things that she expected kids to be able to do at a very, very young age that some parents look at it and say, oh my gosh, my kid could never do that. So I, you know, I did update the list for, you know, our new sense of, you know, oh, kids shouldn't, you know, can't do a lot of stuff that they used to be able to do. Um, but at the same time, you know, this isn't about manual dexterity. This isn't about, you know, what our kids can handle in terms of safety. And, you know, I always try to remind parents that kids use knives safely when they know how to use knives and they have been using them and that the knives are sharp. Giving kids a dull knife is a really bad idea. Kids who don't know how to climb a tree because they've never been allowed to do it are more likely to fall out because, and, you know, step on a dead branch that can't support their weight because they don't have any understanding of what a dead branch feels like because they've never been able to experience that. So there's a reason that we let kids explore age appropriately. And if we wait too long to give kids responsibilities and let them experience things that are dangerous, then we are actually setting up a situation where those dangerous things become more dangerous for them because they don't have um, a sense of what they can do and what they can't do. So it's really, it was really fun to make those lists of what kids can and can't do, mainly because when you go across the country and you talk to people about what they think their kids can and can't do, there's such wild swings depending on how much parents have let kids be competent in the first place. Um, It was fun. Recently, I got to watch a kid uh, bring in some, uh, some horses just cause she's been doing it since she was really, really little. And she's like 12 and she's bringing in these huge, massive horses and sometimes two or three of them at a time. And the person who was with me has a 12 year old. And she just looked at me like, there is no way in the world my 12 year old would ever be able to do that. And I said, well, that's cause she's never done it. And because, you know, the expectation is that she wouldn't have to do that kind of thing. So start thinking a little more be a little more open-minded, push yourself just a little bit to just let your kid try something first and see if they can do it. You might be happily surprised. So another area where kids can experience failure and frustration are friendships, right? So they might get left out yeah. or they might make friends, but mm-hmm. I mean, peers, as you highlight in the book, have such a big influence on kids, more so mm-hmm. than parents, you know, especially when they get in those middle right. school years. 
How mm-hmm. how do you as a parent like handle that? Because you know you might you might notice your kid hanging out with the wrong group of kids, but you don't want to yeah. tell them you can't hang. Like, what do you do about that? Well, it's a so you have to understand sort of why kids make friendships. So you know when they're really really little, you know it's up to us. It's proximity. You know, we choose our friends and then the kids of those friends tend to be their friends and it works out great. And, you know, we get to have total control (laughs) over who their friends are. And that's fine for kids that are really, really young because, you know, friendships at that point um, aren't really about exploring identity. They're more about play and things like that. As they get older, and especially when you get like towards middle school, friendships become more about exploring identity, trying on other people's identity, trying on, you know, things they see in other people. And they start becoming more outwardly focused and understanding that our kids are going to be friends with some kids that make us nervous along the way shouldn't be a reason for us to say, no, 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 you can't be friends with that kid. And of course, I'm talking within reasonable limits. I, my older son, who's now 19, had a friend when he was young that scared the death. It scared me to death. He was a risk taker. He'd broken like 10 bones before sixth grade. He liked to throw himself off of high places with no regard for his safety. And I was positive that come time, you know, for driving, that that kid, uh, there's no way I was going to let my kid get in a car with that dangerous child. But he matured and he changed over time. And also my son was able to see him break all these bones and say, huh, well, that was kind of a boneheaded maneuver. Um, You know, he got to learn more about his own limits by watching his friend. And in a way, I think we should be grateful when our kids make friends with kids who are different from them, who are experimenting with things that maybe our child isn't experimenting with themselves, because then our kid can look at them and say, you know, huh, that is or is not for me. And if you have, if your kid has a friend, let's say your kid's a teenager, and they're making friends with kids who make you nervous, rather than ban, you know, your child from being able to be around that person, which frankly is the fastest way to make your child want to be around that person, is to talk about friendships and say, huh, you know, you've been spending a lot of time with this kid. And I've noticed that you don't really feel good about yourself when you're around that kid. I had this conversation with the mother of a girl recently. Her daughter is friends with a really mean girl and it's making her daughter crazy and sad and depressed and feel terrible about herself. And, you know, the mom, I encourage the mom to have conversations with her daughter. Like, you know, every time you come home with um, hanging out with so-and-so, you just seem sad and you don't seem yourself. And what is it about your friendship with this person that you value? And, you know, model for them really good relationships that you have with people and talk about those relationships. Um, I talk a lot with my kids about the fact that the thing I love about approaching 50 is that my relationships with my friends are no longer competitive relationships. They're supportive relationships. And that's one of the great things about becoming an adult is you can throw away that sort of need to be liked and popular and you can be more attuned to what strengthens you as a person. So having conversations with kids about what makes for good relationships is really, really important. But if you start, you know, saying, forget it, you can't be around that person, um, you're really probably going to drive your child toward that person. So um, it's, you know, it's a tricky, it's a tricky area. Um, I got to write about it for a magazine called Your Teen. And you know, it's really clear that middle school relationships and high school relationships are completely different beasts than elementary school relationships. And it's hard to lose control of who our kids are friends with, but that's what being a parent is all about. Kids are supposed to individuate, supposed to become their own people. And if they try on uh, relationships through other kids and not themselves, then great. They've had a chance to try something on and uh, not necessarily get that tattoo themselves <laughs> and say, huh, okay. That's interesting. Maybe not for me, but that's interesting. So, you know, yes, it's hard. So let's take a look at school because that's where parents, I think, are probably the most paranoid about their kid failing because... Oh, we're nuts. Yeah, Yeah, we're totally There's a lot of, you know, conflict going on there. On the one hand, we said earlier, uh, extrinsic motivation doesn't produce, you know, self-directed people, right? Right. But school, the way it's set up in most places, like we have <laughs> right. grades. It's all about extrinsic motivation right. and getting the right. good test score and getting to the great college. So how do you balance that as a parent where you're trying to, okay, balance these short-term demands of getting good grades and getting to college with 
at the same time, I want to, I want to create a child or help rear a child who has this, this, who wants to learn for the sake of learning because he wants to. Mm-hmm. This is one of the most, I, I do this video series on, on uh, YouTube about frequently asked questions about the gift of failure. And this one's right up there because yeah, you know, parents are like, okay, yeah, I'm with you. This is great. Evidence backs up the fact that we should not be using extrinsic motivators with kids. Okay, now screw you because you're a teacher and you're telling my kid every single day that grades are important and you give points and you give grades and you give scores. And that's absolutely true. And it's been one of the hardest things to deal with. And, you know, while I'd love to say, look, we need to reform the education system and grades stink, which they do. They're not about information. They're about ranking kids. And I've written about that at the Atlantic and in the New York Times. Uh, You know, we have these grading portals that encourage parents to check constantly and micromanage kids' grades. So I think the biggest things we can do are um, realize that kids are getting kids are hearing constantly how important grades and scores and all that stuff is. It's not like when we say to them, sweetie, this French test you have next per- next uh, Friday is really important or, you know, grades in your junior year, those are the ones the colleges are going to see. This is not news to them. So if home could be the one place where we're actually talking about goals, um, I, this is something that I actually stole from what I do at school. I was, I'm a, I was an advisor in middle school. And one of the things I did constantly was talk with my, um, my advisees about what their short term and long term goals for themselves were so that I could tap into and use as levers the things that are important to them. And, you know, if they say, you know, I, they really, I know, I know that their goal is to go to X college or to, you know, play soccer. And in order to do that, they have to have a C or better. Then I can use that as leverage and say, okay, well, how are you going to achieve that goal? Goals are really, really powerful things. And it's the reason that the entire chapter on grades in the book is really about how to help your, to how to talk to your kids about goals. Um, but that also means that we have to model that for our kids. The other thing, unfortunately, that we have to do is just realize, yes, this is the system we're stuck with right now. Um, as much as I'm optimistic that the system is changing, there are a whole, there's a whole lot of people out there working to move away from grades and move toward things, these things called standards-based report cards, standards-based learning, mastery-oriented learning, um, rather than getting a B minus and, you know, the parent goes in to talk to the teacher and say, okay, great, a B minus. What does that mean? What does my kid actually know how to do? Um, there are ways of of evaluating kids that that would give actual information about what they know and don't know. And that's called standards-based learning, standards-based evaluation. So until we have that, I think at what we have to realize is that our job as parents is to temper some of what they're hearing everywhere, to um, give them space to breathe, to, you know, I go to a lot of schools, I get called into a lot of schools that have had suicide clusters and they bring me in to help the parents understand ways to talk to kids that aren't about heightening anxiety and are more about helping kids know what their goals are and create their own strategies for achieving those goals. And that's that's called self-directed executive function. And executive function is sort of, you know, one of the new big areas. Ooh, if we can just strengthen executive function, we can help kids learn better. But that's true. So let's do a little bit more focusing on goals. Let's do a little bit more focusing on the process of learning over the end product, especially with kids who are anxious, especially with kids who are perfectionist. The more we talk about process and less we talk about product, the more we can get their brains off of this spinning and spinning and spinning over the idea of getting, you know, a 100 instead of a 97. And the more we can focus them on, okay, but, but what are you learning and how are you learning and what study techniques are working well for you? And what are you going to do next time? If you got a low grade this time, all of that process talk is, is really essential for helping kids fo- get focused on what's important. And in the end, it's not the grade that's important because grades are not great indicators of learning anyway. It's it's what's being mastered. So that's our job as parents. So also that means no more doing the kids' science fair yourself. Oh gosh. Yeah. I got, I've gotten to write about that a couple places and there is nothing that will motivate a kid more. And I say this from experience than having to sit next to a really crappy trifold poster board 
with some made up data at the last second with Sharpie drawn graphs that they know is crap and that everyone that stands in front of it and asks them how they arrived at their data knows it's crap. The kid's embarrassed. And, um, when that happened with my own kid, uh, the kid, the, the project that my kid created the next year completely under his own steam was amazing because he didn't want to endure what he had gone through the year before where he knew he, he, just completely thrown his hands up in the air and given up and forgotten about it and not planned well enough. Um, the next year, the thing he created was not only great from like an objective, you know, or grade perspective, whatever. He was proud of it. And, uh, and that letting my kid go to the science fair with a piece of crap project was one of the best things I ever did for my kid. I love that. Well, Jessica, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? Well, everything is always at jessicalahey.com. Everything from the show notes for the podcast I do about writing um, with my former New York Times editor, KJ Delantonia, called hashtag am writing with Jess and KJ. You can find me on Twitter at, at Jess Leahy. I mostly tweet about education and child welfare and that kind of stuff. You can find me at Instagram at, at Teacher Leahy and uh, on Facebook as well. Fantastic. Well, Jessica Leahy, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. You are so welcome. Thank you so much for having me. My guest today was Jessica Leahy. She's the author of the book, The Gift of Failure. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can also find out more about her work at jessicalahey.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash gift of failure, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic. 